Howdy, my name's Todd, this is Unchurched, and I'm wondering, have you ever been in a storm? We're in a series called What He Said, where we're exploring uh, the words of Jesus, trying to figure out some, you know, the brass tacks when it comes to Christianity. So um, here's what he said about storms. I'm reading from the Gospel of Mark in the Woost translation. We're in chapter 4, verses 35 through 41 very famous story. If you spent any time in Sunday school as a kid like I did, (laughs) you'll know this one. And if you're brand new to uh, exploring the person and the story of Jesus, uh, this is one of the iconic stories about him. And he says to them, Jesus says to his disciples on that day, evening having come, let us go over to the other side. So he wants to cross to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is a little lake in the northern part of Israel. And having dismissed the crowd, they take him under their care, just as he was, in the boat. And there were other boats with him. And there arises a great windstorm of hurricane proportions. And the waves kept on beating into the boat, so that already it was being filled. And he himself was in the stern of the boat, sleeping on the steersman's leather cushion. And they arouse him from sleep and say to him, teacher, Is it not a concern to you that we are perishing? And having awakened, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, be getting calm, hush up, (laughs) and stay that way. And the wind ceased its raging, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you such timid, fearful ones? How is it that you do not have faith? And they feared a great fear and were saying to one another, who then is this person? that even the wind and sea obey him. It's really fun. Um, As the story progresses, it's really neat to kind of see Jesus' disciples grappling with who the heck he is. I like that because it reminds me of me. Um, What is it now? 11, so 36 years into following Jesus, I'm still trying to figure out who the heck he is and uh, what that means for me. And hopefully for you. All of us have been in a storm. So obviously here we are interpreting uh, the storm that overtook Jesus and his disciples while they attempted to cross the Sea of Galilee as a metaphor for our lives, uh, for the storms that we go through. I don't know if you've ever been sailing in a storm. I am a sailor and I have sailed through storms and it is quite something. The Sea of Galilee is a small lake and it's surrounded by mountains really, well, they're not like, don't think Austrian mountains, they're more like hilly mountains, but they're, you know, they're pretty high. Um, And the winds will funnel down from those mountains kind of catabatically, catabatic winds, look it up, and they kind of crash down onto the Sea of Galilee. And so you can go from a dead calm day on the Sea of Galilee to a raging storm in no time flat. I've actually experienced it. I grew up in Israel and we spent a lot of time at the Sea of Galilee. It's kind of a really beautiful tourist spot in Israel. And uh, I spent a lot of time there as a professional filming, and I have seen that sea go from calm to raging <clears throat> in literally 10 minutes. You can kind of see the clouds coming in, and then boom, the storm is on you. But that's kind of a metaphor for life. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where um, you're just, everything's normal, hunky dory, business as usual, and all of a sudden, boom, out of nowhere, a storm overtakes you, I can certainly um, identify, and I know that many of you can too. So here's what Jesus has to say about handling a storm. Now, I'm kind of stretching the interpretive work here a little bit because I am going to preach from some things that Jesus did, Um, and so I'm giving myself license there because actions speak louder than words. So, um, first thing to do when you're in a storm is to keep moving. We get this out of uh, verse 35. Let us go over to the other side. Now, I know technically speaking, the storm hadn't started yet, but it's interesting to me that Jesus is always moving. He's a bit of a hustler. He doesn't ever really sit still. He always wants to go somewhere new and do something exciting. Uh, In his Galilean ministry uh, time, he was quite the cause celeb. He was a big deal. People were coming from the regions surrounding Galilee from foreign countries uh, and from Israel itself to see this man who was really famous as a faith healer. He was um, famous for healing um, everybody that came to him for relief. So he would start early in the morning and heal people until the end of the day. I was talking with my wife about this recently where, you know, it's, it's a 
it's chic, there's a movement um, <clears throat> in popular Christianity to sometimes reduce Jesus down to a teacher, a philosopher, um, a spiritual leader. Um, and I was just even saying to her this past week that, you know, the, the problem is I think when we begin allowing ourselves to think that's way, it's because there's grown some distance between us and the actual story. When you read the actual stories about Jesus, as I've been doing intensely over the last several months in preparation for this series, um, you really see that the root of his fame is his supernatural ability. He really became famous because of his power as a healer, and he was busy about his business. He was constantly traveling around the region uh, to heal and minister to as many people as possible. So he wants to go to the other side. Let's go. Jesus is always moving. So this is helpful perhaps for you. If you are looking to be one of Jesus's people, you need to expect a life of action. You need to expect a life to some degree. Now, I, I don't know the extent. I think it's different for some uh, than it is for others, but you need to expect a life of difficulty because um, stasis is not really an option when it comes to Jesus. Now, again, whenever you um, interpret something Jesus does or says and you're trying to apply it to a modern day audience all these many years later, it really helps if the thing that you're landing on is not just a one-time occurrence, but a pattern. And certainly the urge to um, leave where you are and go somewhere new is deeply embedded in Jesus's teaching. Um, when he meets his disciples, he urges them to leave their nets and to come follow him. Uh, to the rich young ruler, he says, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. To the woman caught in adultery after he has dismissed her accusers, he says to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And famously, we'll come to this at the end of the series, uh, as he's about to depart to his father's right hand, he says to his disciples, go ye therefore into all the world, excuse me, and preach the good news to every creature. So he's a sender. He's a goer and he's a sender. So if you're going to mess with Jesus, you need to be that way too. You need to keep moving. So storms coming, find yourself in the middle of a storm, keep moving. This is um, universally true. As a sailor who has sailed through storms, the worst thing you can do is sit still. I mean, there is the example of heaving too. When you're really so done and you're about to die, the last thing you do is kind of, you stall the boat, if you will, and it kind of drifts with the waves. But that's the exception to the rule, and the rule is keep moving when you find yourself in a storm. And to deal with storms, you need to have the correct mindset, and that mindset is this, expect difficulty. We get this out of uh, verse 37, and there arose <laughs> a great windstorm of hurricane <laughs> proportions. I really laughed when I, I came to this. I love the Voos translation. If you're new to us today and you're wondering, wow, that's kind of a weird Bible he read from. Um, it is. The, the Voos translation is attempting to stay as close to the original language as possible and expand upon it as much as necessary to convey um, the exact meaning. So that's why the words are sometimes laborious and flowery, a hurricane, a, a storm, a windstorm of hurricane proportion. So I laugh because I thought to myself, and I feel this way when my life gets difficult, maybe you do too, like not only why does there have to be a storm, <laughs> why now? <laughs> and why does it have to be of hurricane proportions? Has that ever happened to you? <clears throat> like <laughs> when things go bad, they go from bad to worse. I mean, you're saying amen, right? Um, I've experienced this. I'm sure you have experienced it. Um, none of us <clears throat> signed up for this. None of us want this. All of us feel offended when our life goes in the crapper. Um, and I just want to say, it's normal. Life is difficult. Um, I think it stands to reason that you'll find it easier to deal with storms when you have expected their arrival. Okay? Life is difficult. Life is stormy. Get used to it. Um, also, I think it's really important, and I've said this many times before, but most of you are new to me, and I'm aware that we are seeing new people every single week, so this may be the first time you're hearing this. Another strategy that's really helpful in the midst of trouble, in the midst of a stormy life, is to make sure that you're really thankful for every moment of relative calm. Um, you know, you can reduce this down to a really great slice of pizza. How many of you know, amen, that a really great slice of pizza is almost a holy moment, right? Well, that's because God invented pizza, right? Uh, so whenever you find yourself, even in the midst of a storm, with a singular moment of relative calm, it will really help you to um, zone in on that moment, to really 
focus in on it, to dwell in that moment for a moment. Um, thankfulness tends to breed thankfulness, and thankfulness as it begins to put down roots in your life uh, tends to lead to gratitude, and gratitude when it's full grown tends to manifest as peace, and I don't know anybody who would rather have a tumultuous life over and above a peaceful one. So cultivating thankfulness for every moment of joy, every moment of beauty in the midst of a stormy life uh, will put you on the path to peace, um, which is exactly what Jesus was doing. And it's what you need to learn to do in the midst of the storm, which is to relax. We get this out of verse 38. Again, it's hilarious. I love to come to a text that just makes me smile without even trying. Um, there's good old Jesus, and he himself was in the stern sleeping. <laughs> How awesome is this? So this is a storm of hurricane proportions, and good old Jesus is crashed out. He's got the joy of the Lord. <laughs> He's asleep in the back of the boat. He is napping in a storm. Um, we could learn from him. So I just want to just commend this to you just to say next time your life gets stormy, uh, do what you can to get cozy and relax. Right? You know this. You're loving this, aren't you? I'm loving it. Um, storms are going to come, but hallelujah, storms are going to go. Okay? It came to pass. It, it doesn't stay forever. Yes, sometimes um, we endure seasons that are difficult. I'm in a year-long season of difficulty, and so, you know, that's an awful long time to be in a storm. So if you're going to be in a storm for a long time, you better make sure you figure out how to find some moments of peace in the midst of it. So let good old Jesus be our example here. He is sleeping in the midst of the storm. Next time you find yourself in a storm, do what you can to find like whatever it takes. I don't know what it's going to take for you. Everyone's wired differently. Um, what helps me feel peaceful might not help you feel peaceful and vice versa. But do the work to know yourself so that when you find yourself in a storm next time, you can make a beeline for the steersman's seat, which is where he was, the leather steersman's seat. I love the detail of the original um, interpretation here. Find yourself a leather steersman's seat, put your head down, and take a nap. When storms come, be like Jesus. Get comfy and relax. You're like, how can I relax in a storm? You can relax in a storm because you trust the boss. I mean, somebody say amen. We get this out of verse 39. Um, so they wake him up. They're like, can't you see we're dying? <laughs> how could you be sleeping? And uh, he, he gets up. I wonder if he's bleary-eyed, you know, when you wake up from a, a nap and you haven't slept long enough, or sometimes you sleep too long, so you feel groggy and worse than you did when you lay down. Anyway, Jesus gets up. <laughs> he looks at the storm. It seems from reading it that he's almost ticked off that uh, the storm came up and caused his disciples to rouse him from his nap, and he says to the storm, be getting calm, hush up, and stay that way. I love this translation because it makes it seem like Jesus has familiarity with the elements of nature. He talks to the storm like it's his friend. He talks to the storm like it's an errant toddler. <laughs> be getting calm, hush up, which is like, shut up. He says, this, shut up already. Be getting calm, shut up, and stay that way. He rebukes the storm like you would rebuke an unruly toddler. I just want to point out how intimately acquainted Jesus is with the forces of nature. This suggests to me that he's in charge. So this is one of the most beautiful things about being one of Jesus' people. You are following the man who is in charge. He's in charge. He's the boss. Oh, if he's the boss, it means you're not. And I know that each of us have times, moments, situations where we, we want to step to the front and we want to take over. But um, let me tell you, in the midst of a life-altering storm, it would be awfully nice to know that uh, the boss is in charge and the boss is your friend. When you trust the boss, peace is possible. So uh, let's learn to do that. And uh, finally, let's remember that um, fear and faithfulness or faithlessness, rather. Fear and faithlessness are our biggest problems. We get this as we close in verse 40. After he calms the storm, <laughs> he rebukes his disciples. He says to them, why are you such timid, fearful ones? I love that. Why are you such timid, fearful ones? How is it that you have no faith? Fear and faithlessness. I think if we're honest, um, these are our biggest twin struggles. 
we're afraid. We're afraid of being left out. We're afraid of death. We're afraid of losing. We're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of pain. We're afraid of suffering. I mean, the list goes on and on. They're so, aren't you afraid? Like, what are you afraid of? Maybe this week, take some time to journal it, just to write it down, the things that you are afraid of. Sometimes those things that we're afraid of can debilitate us. They can really handicap our life to the point that we really end up stuck. And on the other side <clears throat> is faithlessness, um, the death of belief. This is something that all of us deal with. Um, I've dealt with it several times in my life. I feel like I'm just kind of coming up over the edge of the valley of the shadow of death. For a few months there, it got pretty bleak where I was like, man, if God can list, let this happen, all bets are off. And I, I've been there a few times in my life. And let me tell you, it is a very dark valley. I think the death of belief is probably, um, well, it's probably the most serious death there is. Because when faith dies, like I don't really know what else there is. Maybe you're there right now. Maybe you're finding yourself in a situation where it's really hard for you to believe in goodness. Maybe it's really hard for you to believe that God sees you and that God cares. I just want to just say that he does and he loves you and it's going to be okay. It might not be okay right now. It might not be okay for a while. I can testify. I told you I'm going through a year long storm so far. It's almost a year. Okay. It's going to be okay. Keep moving forward. He has not forsaken you. It's going to be all right. Take a deep breath. And even if you only have like the slightest little shred of belief, just, just cling to that. I'll talk about this in coming weeks, but one of the ways to cultivate belief in your heart is to look back on all the ways in which God has been good to you, kind to you in the past. The um, absolute key here is to know the story and your place in it. So this is why, you know, we commend reading your Bible to you. This is why we commend listening to faithful Bible preaching about Jesus to you. Why? Because it immerses you in the story. What is the story? What is the story of God all about? What is he like? Um, how has he interacted with his people uh, throughout time? It's important for you to know the story so that <clears throat> you can find your place in it. When you look at the story of God and his people, you see that his people have gone through storms and he has come through. And the reason that's so important to see is because um, the Bible is very clear that God doesn't change, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So his faithfulness, his holiness, his majesty, his awesomeness, his greatness, his kindness, these character traits that you know outline his godness are with him for all time. He's never going to forsake them. And so if he was faithful to his people in the past, he will be faithful to his people right now. And if you are counted amongst his people, he will be faithful to you. Those kind of memories, when you learn the collective memory of God and his people, and then you begin to trace that faithfulness of God into your life, those <clears throat> memories are like holy memories. They can literally change everything for you. They can move you, even in the midst of the storm, to the place where you say this with conviction and you believe it to such a degree that it literally changes your life. I'm God's friend. It's uh, going to be okay. And uh, next week, what he said about the powers of darkness.